in the origin of species, Darwin had to ease his readers into this new, strange idea of natural selection. And he came up right in chapter one with a very good idea. He started first by talking about artificial selection, the breeding of plants and animals by pigeon fanciers and uh, cattle breeders and the plant domesticators and the like. And having drawn our attention to the successes that animal and plant breeders have had, he then went on to point out, as a sort of segue into his main thing, that there was another variety of selection that had been, that one could see in the human activity of domestication, and he called it, wonderfully, unconscious selection. He says in chapter one, at the present time, eminent breeders try by methodical selection with a distinct object in view. This is the intentionality that Douglas was speaking of, to make a new strain or subbreed superior to anything existing in the country. But for our purpose, a kind of selection which may be called unconscious, which results from everyone trying to possess and breed from the best individual animals, is more important. Thus, a man who intends keeping pointers, the dog, naturally tries to get as good dogs as he can and afterwards breeds from his own best dogs, but he has no wish or expectation of permanently altering the breed. Uh, Darwin goes on, as always, to give some empirical examples, and he points out, he says, there's reason to believe that King Charles's spaniel has been unconsciously modified to a large extent since the time of that monarch. This theme of unconscious selection has been recently taken up most uh, illuminatingly by uh, the next speaker, Jared Diamond, in his, in his book, and I will say more about that when I introduce him. Um, before there could be fully intentional, foresightful breeding, conscious, deliberate, methodical selection, there had to be an, a gradual period of unconscious selection. And Darwin saw that this unconscious selection also itself gradually merged with more deliberate selection. He says, the man who first selected a pigeon with a slightly larger tail never dreamed what the descendants of that pigeon would become through long continued partly unconscious and partly methodical selection. Over all the, these causes of change, he goes on, I'm convinced that the accumulative action of selection whether applied methodically and more quickly or unconsciously and more slowly but more efficiently is by far the predominant power. So then Darwin gives us a trio of selection processes. Methodical or artificial selection, which is relatively fast and foresightful. Unconscious selection, which involves human agency and hence some human intentionality, but which is not deliberate and not really foresightful at all. And then natural selection at large, involving no intelligent agency, no, no direction at all. Now, in making this trio of cases, some people have, I think, have misread Darwin on this point to suppose that, that Methodical selection, artificial selection, and unconscious selection are not really varieties of natural selection at all. They are. They're, they're special cases of natural selection in which the selective pressure is particularly well focused and, and uh, uh, dis distinguished, and hence it's a faster and more powerful uh, uh, design effect than the natural selection, which itself, of course, had produced the capacity for unconscious and methodical selection. First, natural selection had to produce mammals and then eventually hominids and then eventually homo sapiens, the domesticators of plants and animals, which then created these second and third uh, more uh, speedy processes. Uh, the uh, great French poet Paul Valéry once said, and he was talking not about evolution but about poetry, about art, and about science, it takes two to invent anything the one makes up combinations, the other one chooses. Recognizes what he wishes and what is important to him in the mass of the things which the former has imparted to him. What we call genius, 
Valerie goes on to say, is much less the work of the first one than the readiness of the second one to grasp the value of what has been laid before him and to choose it. Now this is interesting because Valerie sees the genius in the choosing, not in the generation. But many have seen it otherwise. Uh, the philosopher of biology, Ronald Amundsen, said in a paper not so long ago on this point, as we proceed higher on the hierarchical stages from evolution to psychology to social or scientific development, we should expect the explanatory force of natural selection to gradually disappear. This is an ironic result of selection's own success at lower levels. The variation has been reduced, and in some cases directed, by selective processes at each lower level. Now, we know today that there's a fourth candidate to add to Darwin's trio, and that's already been mentioned, it's genetic engineering. Here it seems the generation of diversity has been cut essentially to zero, and the genetic engineer simply designs from the beginning exactly the genome wanted and then uh, installs it in the candidate uh, organism uh, uh, to see what happens. It's important to see, though, that even in the case of genetic engineering, this new and uh, uh, distinctly more powerful, swifter form of design, there is still plenty of trial and error, plenty of generate and test. Uh, there's more use of foresight, but even here, the foresight is imperfect, and there's a good me measure of exploratory trial and error if we look closely at the actual practices of genetic engineers. Notice, too, because this is going to be important in the second half of my talk, that we're threatened by genetic engineering. Whereas on the one hand, we have high esteem for such natural products as cotton and wool, such natural foods as grain, tomatoes. We are deeply suspicious of, of genetically redesigned tomatoes, of genetically redesigned uh, foods and fibers. Uh, we are currently having a great difficulty treating those as, as natural and as acceptable products of human, of human art. Uh, we honor the naturalness of cotton, for instance, failing to recognize that it is just as much a genetically engineered product as those suspect tomatoes. Uh, it's just that the genetic engineering took place over a much longer period of time. And if you want to know more about that topic, read Jared Diamond's wonderful book.